Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the Brooklyn Tea Party meeting for the June 26 meeting for the Brooklyn Tea Party, our first in-person meeting of the year. So thank you. A lot of people couldn't make it today because it is early voting, and a lot of our members work for the Board of Elections for working on the polls. So a lot of them are also helping out candidates. Uh, we had one that just stopped by also, and he had to leave, but he had a couple people with him. So uh, they're also looking to, you know, they're coming by, they, they, they're trying to get those votes. So uh, we appreciate them to stopping by. On that note, let's start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Right here is the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. I would like to thank you all once again for coming to the Brooklyn Tea Party meeting. We have a special guest joining us today, and that will be our candidate for the New York State Comptroller's Office, Paul Rodriguez, who also ran for the New York City Comptroller's uh, Office last year, I believe, just on the conservative line. Yes. This. And this time he's running on the conservative and Republican line. So, mm -hmm. and independent? Uh, hopefully, yes. Hopefully, I haven't, yeah. haven't heard confirmation that it's there already. Great. Right. You know, they go through the contest. So, three, three times a lady. <laughs> <laughs> Old song. Now you have to charm. I'll oh, identify as such. <laughs> so, so uh, on that, uh, so we, we, we thank him for coming here today. And uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for our guest. So I'm not going to read this. this is for you. Oh, thank you. Should I move this? Over? Yeah. This is just uh, rambling on with you all. So you don't, uh, have, you don't have the note cards that say uh, say hello to. Yeah, them. right. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, you make eye contact. Sit down. <laughs> Magical handshake. Now you got to sit. Right. <laughs> 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 Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Rodriguez, and I am the uh, endorsed Republican and Conservative Party candidate for state controller. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Brooklyn Tea Party, for inviting me again to come and speak to you all. As Glenn had mentioned, uh, last year I did run for city controller. It is my first sort of foray back into politics after being away for many years. Uh, and I only ran in the Conservative Party line. Uh, I won't go into the whole issue of what happened last year with, you know, obviously the, the governor, uh, excuse me, the mayor's primary race and how that affected the controller, what have you. But needless to say, on election night, despite being in the third party, uh, conservative party alone, I was able to garner an enlarged Thanks, I think, in large part thanks to all of you because when I met with you towards the end of the campaign, it was, I think, one of the best uh, meetings and uh, one of the best times that I had talking to people, very engaging. We were able to garner about 59,000 votes, which is actually about 5.5% of the vote, which for a third party candidate, being the Conservative Party candidacy, it was equivalent to about two and a half to three times the number of registered conservatives in New York City. So, uh, Jerry Kassar, a Conservative Party chairman, was very, very pleased, needless to say. Uh, and what I think what that mostly also showed, there was a lot of groundswell, there's been a lot of enthusiasm uh, among people on the right, among independents. Uh, even at the city level, we're so skewed towards the left of wanting to have a change. But we're seeing that almost on steroids now, obviously, statewide. Uh, so this year, uh, thanks, uh, Again, I was recruited uh, to consider running for state controller, and after having done uh, the thing last year, I said, well, you know, we, this would need to be a bit uh, a more serious effort. We need to be unified, uh, and we need to have the support institution and what have you. So uh, I was thankfully was uh, endorsed unanimously by both the Republican and the Conservative Party, and hopefully we will also get the Independence Party line. So it's vote RCI. This November 8th. So, for some of you who don't know me, uh, let me just tell you briefly about myself. Um, I was, I'm a, well, I was born here in New York, in Queens, um, um, to two working class Puerto Rican parents. I have a very humble background. Uh, my mother was an executive assistant. My father was a carpenter, union carpenter, who had served uh, and fought with the Marines in Vietnam. Uh, 
Shortly after I was born, they separated, so eventually my mother uh, decided that to, get, uh, to have a better life for me. We moved on, we went back. Uh, my family's originally from Puerto Rico, so we moved back there, lived there for a long, a, a big part of my childhood. Then uh, when I was 11 years old, we moved to Atlanta, Georgia. So the good part about that, particularly on a statewide race, is that having lived outside of just the confines of New York City uh, or just one place, it really has given me a great perspective because uh, I'm able to see things the way perhaps a lot of other people in just New York City alone cannot, and I'm able to understand, um, if you will, more of the suburban, the rural, uh, and really, uh, when, I, when I hear people in Manhattan say, oh, I don't understand how you could vote that way, or how people view things that way, it's because you need a little perspective. We may live in the capital of the world, but we have very provincial thinking oftentimes. So, you need to expand. So needless to say, I was raised by a single mom, worked my way through school, and eventually cold called my way into a job at Solomon Brothers. It's the old uh, investment bank that's part of City now. Uh, I started out as an equity research analyst, and no, that is not a super woke HR diversity consultant. <laughs> an equity research analyst is a financial analyst, where the people who would go in, uh, look at companies, uh, do cash flow projections, write reports, and decide whether, recommend whether you should buy or sell the shares of that particular stock. Eventually, I transitioned, and I worked in many different firms, covered many different sectors, uh, developed markets, emerging markets, eventually transitioned over to credit analysis, uh, and eventually became a corporate banker, uh, working primarily with US-based multinationals. Uh, first, in Latin America, uh, first trying to do business within Latin America, because I worked for a Spanish bank, but then I worked for an Australian bank, so then I was, uh, my focus was on Asia Pacific. Uh, so throughout my career, for good or not, I've had to work with a lot of industries or regions or companies in distress. And uh, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we are definitely in a great deal of distress here in the state of New York right now. We have the highest taxes in the nation. We have a cost of living, a crippling cost of living that's just getting worse. And we had that before the pandemic. Uh, we had that before the spike in inflation, but of course it's only making things worse now. Aside from that, uh, New York City in particular, but it, it brought us out to New York State, which was one of the safest cities and states in the country, now is getting to a point where you can't seem to walk down the street, where people don't want to ride the subway. You know, I keep hearing things about, well, uh, we still need commuters and we still need tourism to recover. And that's good, and once we do, things are gonna get better in the city, and I always counter, you're right. But how is that gonna happen if people don't wanna commute because they don't wanna get on the subway? How is that gonna happen when tourists don't wanna to come to New York because it's too dangerous? And also, if you're trying to entice commuters to come back, how is that gonna happen if they say, they say, well, okay, I'm not gonna take the subway, but I'll drive in. Oh yeah, but I'm gonna slap a, 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 conge a congestion pricing on you. Not to mention the fact that gasoline is through the roof. Uh, it's hard to get parking. Everything is just expensive. It's just an expense after expense after expense. So what has that led to? A mass exodus of people from the state of New York, certainly from the city of New York. Uh, in fact, even the downstate progressives who supposedly love all these things, even they're moving away to Texas and Florida and other places. And of course, they'll do it, I mentioned this to you last year, they'll do it under the guise that they want to infiltrate. Oh, they're just infiltrate. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna infiltrate Texas and Florida. If along the way I don't pay state taxes, if along the way I don't have to stick a mask on me, if along the way I can go to places without vaccinated, if along the way I have a good quality of life, if along the way I have more space to live in well, that's just a sacrifice I'll take so that I can infiltrate and turn uh, Texas and Florida into it. So, gotta respect their dedication. Wait. <laughs> okay, so I'm running for state controller. Now, many people have an inkling of controller. Sounds important. It's one of the statewide offices, but oftentimes they don't really know exactly what the controller does, who it is, and what are the differences between, let's say, state or city controller. So, I'll just give you two big picture reasons why you should care and why it's important. There's two principal jobs of the state controller. First, he or she is supposed to be the primary watchdog to make sure that taxpayer money in any endeavor where state funds go into is not being squandered, that fraud, waste, and abuse is being looked at. 
And that includes the state's $220 billion budget. Again, that's just the state government. If you include New York City into that, which is separate, then we're, we're talking about over 300 and, we're talking about $325 billion. But let's just focus on the state. Aside from that, the state controller is the sole trustee for the state's pension fund, uh, which contrary to the city controller, where there's five different pensions and there's a board of, of trustees on each one, one of the unique things about New York is one of those states where you have basically one person as the sole trustee of the pension fund. So that totals right now, so the latest figure, about $280 billion. So let's put this into context. One individual, one, can exert influence over about a half a trillion dollars of state monies, whether it's through the bully pulpit, whether it's through the, um, the auditing authority that they have in terms of looking at contrasts, in terms of looking at how different agencies are run, whether it's making investment decisions, obviously, on the pension plans. Many of those investment decisions, which increasingly have been politicized, so it's, it's, for, it's very important for you. Now, unfortunately, our incumbent, uh, Mr. Tom DiNapoli, I will posit to you has failed on both counts. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Mr. Uh, Tom DiNapoli. Uh, he is the longest serving uh, career politician, the longest serving elected official in the state of New York right now. He spent 20 years in the state assembly where he was known as a yes man for former Speaker Shelley Silver, the, you know, the one who went to jail. And died. And then uh, he served 15 years as state controller. And mind you, when he interviewed for the job of state controller, because initially he was appointed, not elected, uh, from what I understand, he was the least qualified and I was at the bottom of the list. But magically, he's the one who eventually ended up with the job. <laughs> and during the 15 years that Mr. Napoli has been in office, he has coincidentally and not coincided with one of the worst waves of corruption in state government. It's been three compromised governors, one of them, uh, two of them resigning, one attorney general that had to basically go to jail, um, and also obviously a lieutenant governor who was indicted and resigned. And not just that, even within his own house, if you will, he couldn't really keep oversight. Uh, I was reminded that a few years ago, the person that Tom DiNapoli and his staff had hired to be the head of fixed income and portfolio management for the state pension plan, who at the time uh, was overseeing about 25% of the assets of the pension plan, well over $50 billion. This is someone that they hired, mind you, not when Tom DiNapoli first came into office. He had already been in office for a while. He ended up being uh, convicted and going to jail as well for pay-to-play bribery scheme in which he basically took about $100,000 in everything from cash, gifts, stripper dances, drugs, other types of favors. So he could basically funnel over a billion dollars, about a billion and a half dollars of business to two different brokerage firms. Now mind you, this was not when Tom Napoli first came into office. He had already been there a while, and it's especially telling when you keep in mind that the person that he replaced, Alan Hevesy, had gone to jail for precisely the same thing. So if we can't really depend on Tom Napoli to be able to keep his own house clean, how do we expect him to keep clean the whole state? And he really hasn't. Now everyone agrees, Tom Napoli is a very nice man. Everyone agrees, and he's got that wonderful smile, smiling Tom, I call him snoozing Tom because he's asleep on the switch. <laughs> but Tom Minapoli is a very nice man. So much so that he's com been completely oblivious to all the corruption around him. Or worse, he knows about it, but he's chosen to do what most people know him for. He doesn't rock the boat, he doesn't shake things up, he basically doesn't stick his neck out too much. He's happy to go after petty corruption here and there. $5,000 here, $10,000 there. In fact, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the recent things, because he likes to put out these big press releases, oh, today in conjunction, or his office, in conjunction with the state police and this and that and all this stuff, we caught this person 
uh, returning money. So let me give you one of the latest examples that I uh, kind of heckled him a little bit about online. There was a, uh, a local county clerk who decided that she would pad her hours a bit more so she could qualify to 20, for 25 hours a week so that she could qualify for vacation time. I'm not saying this correct, but, but just put into context. So it turns out that over a seven year period, that amounted to about $11,000 of additional uh, compensation. Seven years. So do the math. I'll do it for you. That's about $131 of additional compensation per month over seven years. In this, he puts out a big press release. He says, look, we are looking out after the taxpayer's money. We're making sure the taxpayer's money is not squandered. We took this lady who weaseled out of, you know, basically uh, weaseled out $11,000 or so dollars from the government over, over seven years. And we did it in conjunction with the New York State Police. I'm sure the New York State Police doesn't have better things to do. But again, I'm not, I don't want to downplay saying that you shouldn't go after these things. Yes. But if you're willing to go after these things, we have one of the most corrupt states in the country, unfortunately. Uh, we have one of the most wasteful governments. We have one party rule, which basically translates to the fact that people know, why should they worry about really delivering for the people or worrying about losing their jobs? If they're under the mentality, they can do whatever they want and they're constantly going to be reelected and reelected and there's gonna be no consequence, there is no incentive for them to do anything different. So when I say of Tom DiNapoli, you've never been known as someone who stands up to power when it counts. You didn't do it to Shelley Silver. You didn't stand up to Spitzer or to Cuomo. And you're definitely not standing up to Hoka right now. The only time you say anything is at the very end when Cuomo was completely out of favor and about to be, uh, about to be, uh, about to resign and put it out. Uh, or then when there was grumbling about him coming back to run. In fact, the nursing home audits, the Department of Health audits, uh, investigating the, the nursing home scandal in terms of uh, putting out the wrong uh, mortality numbers. He only put that report out when all of a sudden Andrew Cuomo started talking about just making a comeback. He's got about eight million in the kitty, what have you. So he puts this thing out and you know, he's, he's the, you know, the, the great fighter for the taxpayers. And basically what the report does, first of all, it just simply restates exactly what a New York Times article had done six months before. Why he had been sitting on it all this time, uh, who knows, I'm sure there was a reason. Not, not political whatsoever. But when you look at this audit, and, and you know me coming from a financial background, the idea of audit it seems so, you know, it's a little bit odd. Uh, because it's not audited in the sense of performance review, and sometimes it's very qualitative, not quantitative. But it's the, the, that audit on the nursing home scanner starts with first, A. Please remind, let me let you know that we obviously didn't get all the information that we needed. That's fair enough, fair, okay. It's true. No one really wants to kind of open uh, and maybe disclose everything. But it's obviously incumbent upon you, the controller, and your staff who has the power to push. But okay. Please let, please remind you, we didn't get all the information we wanted that were resistant. Two, well, you know, they're understaffed and under and under but and, you know and, and they're underfunded. They said, okay, well maybe that's true, maybe it's not, it's COVID. Depends how you look at it. But then when you read the report, you come to the conclusion that definitely there was deception going on. Now whether it was done at the behest of the governor, yes, no. Whether it was done because of cowardice of going against the governor. Whether it was done because of incompetence, because they didn't know how to calculate the numbers. The point is, the public was deceived, wrong information was put, and even when they knew that they were putting out wrong information, they continued to do so. So then you go, okay, fine, that, that sounds pretty bad to me. Uh, for whatever reason, that didn't catch uh, Governor Cuomo, uh, and Letitia James didn't think it was valid enough to bring any prosecutions or anything, but okay, fine. So what does the controller decide or put forth as uh, their recommendations to the department. Well, what, uh, among the top there is that, okay, let's hold someone accountable. Let's refer something to the district attorney, let's, or to the attorney general. Let's do something to somewhere. No. Does anybody get fired? Does anybody get reprimanded? No. The, one of the first things he puts, we need to give them more federal funding. Mm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when has giving a politician or a bureaucrat more money 
ever made them more honest, more competent, <laughs>